One in two adults at some point in their lifetime are going to develop cancer. So this is a pretty alarming rise. As you say, we all know people uh, who are either suffering from, who have suffered from, or who even have died from cancer. You mentioned at the start about soy. I have never covered on this podcast food and how it can help us with cancer, whether that's for prevention of cancer or potentially as part of the treatment regime for cancer. So I wonder if you could speak to a little bit about food and and how we can think about that in terms of cancer prevention and treatment. Yeah, well, so there's a whole field of research that was developed in the 1970s by a researcher named Michael, Dr. Michael Sporn from the National Cancer Institute, looking at the opportunity to, of intercepting cancer before it becomes a clinical problem. This is this whole idea of cancer prevention. It, originally, it was looking at chemicals that could prevent cancer from starting at its early stages. Then it became angio prevention, which is can we interfere with angiogenesis so the cancers actually can't grow a blood supply as a way of controlling it. And now we know that there's plenty of foods that have been studied um, that actually have been shown to be associated with reduced risk of cancer, whether it's green tea, whether it's soy, whether it's tomatoes, um, whether it's um, stone fruit, you know, peaches and um, uh, plums. Um, uh, there's there's a, a, a plethora. In fact, I write about more than 100 different foods in my book, ETP Disease, that actually have various abilities to um, uh, in, uh, impact on angiogenesis towards health. Now, what I think is really amazing is how foods can be used during cancer treatment. And the reason that's so poignant, and I think for people listening who may know somebody undergoing cancer treatment right now. I mean, look, you're, you're a doctor, we're both doctors. How many times has a patient who has cancer asked us um, uh, very earnestly, hey, doc, I've got cancer, I'm getting treatment, I'm getting my chemo, but what should I be eating? Is there anything you can advise me to, right? That's such a common question. Yeah. It's a question that almost every cancer patient asks their doctor, and it's a question that almost no doctor can answer. So the typical response, that a patient gets is incredibly frustrating and 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 aggravating them because the doctors just say, yeah, you know what? Either they say, I don't know, there's nothing, there's nothing out there because there's no evidence on food can help, or they say, you know, go eat whatever you want, go eat some junk food or some fast food because at least you get some nutrition. The most important thing is you don't lose weight. Well, actually, science has said both of those things are not true. Number one, actually cutting down your caloric intake during cancer treatment actually reboots your health defenses to fight cancer. <clears throat> so intermittent fasting and you know uh, manipulating your metabolism uh, by lowering caloric intake actually is an anti-cancer strategy, number one. Number two, actually there are certain foods you can eat that actually can help you fight cancer. And the best, most compelling examples all have to do your health defenses. So um, there is the newest form, most profound form, uh, uh, of cancer treatment that's a biggest advance in 100 years for cancer treatment is immunotherapy. And immunotherapy, which is used everywhere, UK, North America, um, Russia, China, everywhere, is a new type of cancer treatment that doesn't poison the body like chemotherapy does. And it's not even a targeted therapy. That's like a heat-seeking missile you, you infuse into the body. <clears throat> immunotherapy is a lot more simple and more natural in its concept hey, let's just use the body's own immune system and harness it to be able to destroy cancer. Because remember we talked about this early on, like cops on the beat, the immune system conducts surveillance and takes out the bad guys, the drug dealers on the, sitting on the street corner. Well, what happens if you had cancer, even if it's metastatic and spread? What happens if we allow your own immune system to do it? So this is now reality. Immune therapy is being given to cancer patients um, uh, and it allows your immune system to wipe out cancer. It is so dramatic that in about 20% of people, you get a phenomenal response. And in a smaller group of people, you can, your immune system can wipe out cancer completely. I give an example of in the US, one of our oldest living presidents is President Jimmy Carter. You know, he's a peanut farmer. He came from the state of Georgia. When he retired from his presidency, when he finished his presidency, he went back to his sunny state and he wanted to build houses in, with this nonprofit, this NGO called Habitat for Humanity. They spent a lot of time 
outdoors under the baking sun, building houses for homeless people. Okay. Um, and in so doing, he got a lot of sun damage, which caused mutations in his skin, which led to skin cancer that spread to his liver and his brain. So he was in his early 90s when he was diagnosed with mel metastatic melanoma. Because it had spread, and melanoma is such a deadly cancer, um, most of his doctors basically said, this is game over. So he withdrew from public life. He wrote his own obituary and it was about to sort of just, you know, um, make uh, uh, sort of meet his maker. And he, he, he sort of became he got he became at peace with himself. But then at the 11th hour, he enrolled into a clinical trial of one of these immune therapies. It's, like, it's something called a checkpoint inhibitor. And um, and he got this infusion and remarkably at 90 years old his own immune system reared up on its haunches and wiped out and did what it's supposed to do. It wiped out all the cancer in his brain, in his liver, all over his body. And he went from having metastatic cancer with brain metastasis. That's a game over kind of situation when you and I are training to actually having no cancer. And he's alive today with no sign of cancer. Wow. Happened to my mother too, who had endometrial cancer, cancer in the lining of the uterus. It spread everywhere. And we put her on a uh, immune therapy, same kind as the president did, at Persiform president, and in three treatments only over the course of nine weeks, once every three weeks, no chemo, okay? All of the, her, her uh, uh, 80-year-old immune system wiped out every bit of cancer in her body, and she's been completely cancer-free. This isn't even a cure. This is a reset. This is getting back to baseline, restoring health, yeah. because that's what your body's supposed to do. This is kind of really full circle to what we were talking about at the start of this conversation, isn't it? The body's resilience, the body's natural ability to, you know, patrol itself and actually repair damage and be resilient. And it's it's incredible now that you're talking about these drugs that are being used to really but, help but, but, support the immune but, system. But it but I think I think what you're coming to is that food can also do that as well. Is yeah. that right? Yeah. Well. Well. No. Uh, yeah. Yes. But it's it's sort of the combination. So remember, I said that for this type of immune therapy, twenty percent of people have these really amazing responses, which means that the majority don't. And for a long time, we were scratching our heads, saying, "Okay, uh, what's going on?" Because there's nothing more frustrating than a breakthrough that only works for a small portion of people. We've got to use science to figure out what makes the difference. Well, so one of my colleagues, Dr. Laurence Zipogel in Paris, she's at the um, Institut Gustave Roussy, which is a, one of the big cancer research centers of Europe, looked at 200 patients with different types of cancer, all getting immune therapy. And she looked at every, compared every uh, 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 dimension that she could between people who responded and people who did not respond very well to immunotherapy. And when you know what she found? The difference was one bacteria in their gut. It wasn't genetics, it wasn't body size, wasn't obesity, it wasn't concomitant disease. It was actually one bacteria. That bacteria is Acromantia mucinophila. Now this is out of the 39 trillion bacteria in the body, this one has been studied and it's stuck out. It's kind of like finding a fossil in the hillside. There's probably a lot of fossils, but they, she found this one. This uh, bacteria was present in responders and if, you had this, you responded to immune therapy and had a better outcome for, with cancer. And if you didn't have it, man, your outcome was not good. So how do you get this bacteria to grow? Well, it turns out it's all about your diet because there's no probiotic you can take for acromancia. Acromancia can be grown. You can grow acromancia in your gut by having... Uh, by help by eating foods that help your gut secrete mucus. Now that sounds disgusting to a lot of people. It's gross, mucusy gut. But in fact, our gut naturally secretes mucus, yeah. just like our mouth normally secretes saliva. And and this bacteria, Acromantia, it's got a, its full name. It, Acromantia is just its first name. Its last name is Mucinophila. So Acromantia Mucinophila means it loves to grow mucus. Yeah. So when you actually eat foods like pomegranates. Uh, or pomegranate juice, or cranberries, or conquered grapes, or conquer, or the juice from these. It it prompts your gut to secrete healthy mucus. It's kind of like fertilizer in the soil. Your yeah. garden's going to love to grow better. That acromantia grows there. Um, uh, it actually makes you respond. So that actually is a difference of how foods can make the difference in one bacteria. Now, 
two weeks ago, a paper, a landmark paper was published in the journal Science, which is one of the big, credible scientific journals, major scientific journal. <clears throat> this is like an 80 person study led by MD Anderson Cancer Research Center in the United States uh, with the National Institutes of Health. And they looked all, again at melanoma that had spread, people getting immunotherapy, and they found that another bacteria, they found the second bacteria of responders. It's called ruminococcus, all right? Now, I, I encourage your listeners not to stress out about remembering these fancy names. It's kind of like when you go to a, a museum, you know, go to the dinosaur hall, you're not gonna remember the, the Latin names of all the dinosaurs. You're gonna remember, man, that was pretty cool, that big one, yeah, it's called T-Rex, but you don't need to remember all the Latin names. So um, ruminococcus uh, is, is, is part of a responder profile for immunotherapy. And what they wanted to find out is what dietary intake was correlated with this healthy bacteria with a good outcome. And it was dietary fiber. And what they found is that those people who ate more dietary fiber had more ruminococcus and had a better response. So how much fiber? They calculated it. They calculated for every five grams of fiber per day, they got a 30% decrease in mortality. 30, okay, on immunotherapy. Now, what's five grams of fiber a day? This. That's how much you get, five grams of fiber in an average size pair. That's all you need to eat a day to make this difference. Now, think about that. If you had melanoma and if you were getting immunotherapy, your doctor's probably not telling you yet to actually eat fiber, but this is the nature of breaking research in food as medicine. It's not food versus medicine. I'm not on a hilltop waving a thing of kale saying, everybody should forget about their medicines and don't go to your doctor anymore. What I'm saying is that food plus medicine, it is another powerful yeah. tool in the toolbox and people with cancer need to know that. Yeah, they really do. And you remind me of a story I've heard you share, I think in an interview I saw of yours in the past where there was a patient who was due to have some immunotherapy and you checked out her stool and found out that she had no acomancia mucinophilia. So you halted things for three weeks. You encouraged these kind of foods. That went up and she responded perfectly. Is that an accurate uh, reflection of that story? Yeah, that, that you captured it exactly. And, and so I think that, you know, as we move into the future, we're going to be putting together this puzzle that, you know, it's, it's almost like we've seen what we need to do for yeah. years. We, like we intuitively, we've known that foods can uh, help us get better, that foods and medicine have got to work together. There's got, you know, why do cancer patients ask that question? Because they know yeah. inherently there's got to be something there. And, and so one of the things that I'm really committed to doing, you know, in my career is, uh, trying to up the level that doctors actually have to be able to take the latest science and answer those patient questions. Like patients don't really want to know all the mumbo jumbo, the scientific details. They're not equipped in many cases to really go into that level of detail. But doctors need to be sophisticated yeah. enough. If you can understand how an immunotherapy works, which is pretty complicated, then you need to be able to understand how a food works. Yeah. I mean, I think you've done a wonderful job uh, from what I've seen over the last years of spreading the word about this. Your book, Eat to Beat Diseases, I think it's a wonderful read for anyone, you know, public or doctors to learn more about what kind of foods can help them. I think there's over 200 foods in there that you've detailed. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. There's <clears throat> over, over 200 foods. I've, you know, so this whole idea that uh, our body craves diversity our health defenses respond to so many different foods. So I basically put together a catalog of more than 200 foods that activate one or more or yeah. multiple health defenses. And the wonderful thing, and this is really one of the uh, sort of the take home messages I want your viewers and listeners to have in here, that the foods that activate our health defenses taste great. Many of them are part of traditional food yeah. cultures, Mediterranean cultures, Asian cultures. So you don't have to fear your food anymore for health. We don't have to think about taking away all the foods that we love to eat. Um, we can actually lean into the foods that we love that are healthy for us and start there. And so one of the things that I do, you know, I've always challenged people who go, well, you know, I've never really liked Dr. Lee to eat healthy. So I'm kind of bummed out. I give them a Sharpie. 
and a copy of my book. And I say, go to the tables. And I said, take five minutes and leaf through here and circle every food that you like, that you like to eat. And I've never met anybody who wouldn't be able to circle 10 foods at least. And then I, and then they, I, 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 they come back to me and I'm like, look, you've identified <clears throat> all these circled foods, activate your health defenses, start with these, stick with these, and then explore all these yeah. other foods that are out there. That's, that's the best way to enrich our lives and our health at the same time. Yeah, and th this knowledge you give people, uh, Dr. Lee, is very empowering because it could be that that person who does that and circles these foods goes, oh, I'm, I'm already having like mushrooms and bees. I'm already eating foods. And even that just reframes it in their mind that they're already using food as medicine for their body. You mentioned cancer patients. Of course, of course they want to know what else they can do. Uh, whether it's cancer or anything, patients want to feel a sense of agency over their health yeah. and their life, right? So, you know, it, no one does well when they think, well, I can't do anything. I just need to leave it up to that treatment or that doctor. We all like to feel that we're sort of playing a role and participating in our health. So I think your work and research and your books and these masterclasses you run uh, on your website, I think are so helpful at giving people that agency. When it comes to cancer, Dr. Lee, there's a lot now about sugar and cancer. And I think this is where there's a bit of complexity around food because some of these foods, of course, uh, let's say kiwi fruit or you know pomegranate juice or, or the sort of foods you're talking about, of course, some of them can raise our blood sugar. Some of them do contain degrees of sugar. I know they come with lots of other ingredients as well, but how can you help us look at that? What's the relationship between sugar and cancer? And then how does that impact the foods that we consume? Yeah, it's a great question. And I get asked this a lot. Uh, what I try to do is to um, make people feel comfortable with the idea that our body uh, needs sugar. In fact, the organ in our body that needs the most sugar is our brain. It is, it is uh, you know, sugar fuels our metabolism. And the key is that in most people who are able to, your body is able to process a, 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 a small amount of sugar without a problem, without any problem whatsoever. And so the sugars that you might have encounter in your whole foods, so fruits and vegetables, um, uh, those are completely fine. Your body should be able to take care of that. It's the, the sugars that are dangerous for diseases and the sugars that damage your microbiome that uh, uh, spark inflammation, that can even damage your DNA. That's the concept of added sugar. So it's a can of soda that's got 10 tablespoons of added sugar to it to make it really sweet. No body, no human body can, can, can tolerate that over any period of time. And so what I try to say is that like, it's so easy, so tempting when it comes to something like sugar to, to go for that all or nothing approach. <clears throat> no, our body needs a little sugar. Your body can actually handle most sugar when it comes in a fruit or a vegetable. It's just fine. Added sugar, candies, cakes, sodas, okay? Um, uh, you know, uh, those are the ones that easily overwhelm you. So if you're sensitive to sugar, uh, just like you've got diabetes, you got to sort of cut down or cut out those things and be super mindful uh, of, of making those type of choices. But fruits and vegetables, you have to look at the human data, okay? Don't focus on how much sugar is in a mango. Mango is pretty fr sweet fruit. Take a look at the human data to show that people who eat mango um, and other tropical fruits have a much lower incidence of disease X and Y and Z. Look, it, 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 you, you can't argue with the science yeah. and you can't argue with the data. Um, uh, sugar itself, uh, nothing that's natural is by itself uh, inherently evil. And I think that's the thing that I'm trying to get people to think about with sugar. It's a matter of source. It's a matter of quantity and a matter of degree.